Hi everybody, today's guest is Jeff Bolaski of ATLAWIP. Blame the <laughs> yes. yes, yes, thank you. Awesome. He is the head honcho, the honcho, the it's his law practice, and you basically just got your lottery grant of a Cracker Jack box, right? It was a large Cracker Jack box, but it was nonetheless. So what'd you pull out of there? What kind of qualifications have you got? I have a TSSCI, we were talking about, mm -hmm. a top secret SCI clearance. I've got five degrees, ranging from a bachelor in electrical engineering, a master's in engineering, an MBA, an LLM, and a Juris Doctor. What's uh, an LLM? It's a Master of Laws. Oh, okay. Some attorneys don't like to work, so they go on to a higher level of specialization. Yeah. And I did that. Um, I'm a registered patent attorney, so I can qualify to file patents. Uh, and I've got various awards and certifications through my 12, 16 years in the Army. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, today we're going to talk about the difference between trademarks, intellectual property, copyright, and then we're going to talk specifically about how these things impact brand owners and Amazon sellers. So let's start off with what is intellectual property what is a trademark what is copyright can you give us like a brief definition absolutely intellectual property is an intangible right everybody knows real property like land everybody knows personal property like that laptop intellectual property is usually a piece of paper that somebody holds and it has to do with some type of right now you already mentioned copyrights trademarks but what falls under the umbrella of intellectual property is usually four different types. Okay. Um, the ones that impact Amazon sellers the most are trademarks and copyrights. And those are very commonly known. But the other two are patents and then trade secrets. Trade secrets right. largely don't apply to Amazon sellers. What the four do, and sometimes they overlap both in the law as well as in practice and how it affects our sellers. Trademarks are brand recognition. It can be any, anything from a smell to a name, to a tagline, to a color. I mean, I'm loving it is McDonald's. Uh, here in Atlanta, orange for construction means Home Depot. Plumeria, the scent, has been a trademark. Oh. The color of uh, dry cleaning pads, green. Everybody knows Qualitex. Everybody, IP. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, so anything that can identify a source with that can serve as a trademark. Copyrights are written under the Copyright Act, and it's more of the literary artsy stuff you think about. Movies, books, songs, anything that, or art itself, are protected by copyrights. Patents are the inventions. This is what gizmos are protected by. And then obviously trade secrets. Um, we've got one here in Atlanta, the secret recipe to Coke. Mm -hmm. Highly guarded trade secret. So those are the four. Okay. And um, you can also patent, in addition to inventions, processes as well, which a lot of people don't realize, right? Yes and no. Um, in the early 2000s, everybody went wild with the internet and had a big, big upsurge in processy patents. Since then, two things happened. The Leahy American Invents Act, as well as a different policy. The USPTO has been granting a lot less of processy patents because they're not concrete enough and they're more abstract ideas that are not patentable. And in fact, they've created new processes like um, CBMs to defeat those patents that got granted. So okay. yes and no. Okay. So. A lot of people who are starting out in the brand creation process, whether it be private label or a bundle brand or whatever, um, they don't know when is the when in the process of the birth of a product brand is the right time to bring in expertise of a lawyer. It's not necessarily day one, but maybe not, maybe before you're ready to file brand registry. I don't know about definitely day one because there's a lot of things that attorneys can guide you through from the get-go. Okay. For example, picking the type of business organization that you're going to protect yourself under. I mean, if you start sourcing or if you start selling from day one, you want your personnel assets to be protected. Mm. On day one, you also want the best tax uh, shelters and the way to pay the least amount of taxes. 
So in that respect, sometimes it helps to have a roadmap. Now, specifically IP-wise, it helps to start planning. I think you were talking about trademarks. When is it about the time to start spending some money on trademarks? And I really think it's a business decision, obviously. Once you start some type of brand or some type of logo that you're wedded to, that you're attached to, and you're going to start using it, you'll want to protect yourself with and distinguish yourself with a trademark. There's a couple of reasons. Number one, barrier to entry is very low. As opposed to patents that take three to five years to become granted, cost twenty, thirty thousand dollars all said and done. Typically a patent application or a trademark application mm -hmm. will cost less than a thousand dollars. And you don't even have to be a trademark attorney to file one in fact. But it helps to have one there to guide you through the process to make sure that you avoid some of the pitfalls and get what you want as soon as possible. It is a confusing process, and especially if it's not something you do regularly, I think bringing an attorney can really make a big difference. I've done it both ways, and so I think finding a good attorney is worth it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between uh, trademarking like the name of your brand versus the actual visual like logo? Because I don't think people understand that it's two different kinds of trademarks. Am I right about that? Or am I Absolutely. Off okay. Uh, the first one that you recognized was called a word mark, where it is the word. Um, another type is a logo mark, where it's the logo. And a lot of companies have both. Let's use Nike as an example. Nike is trademarked the word Nike, but they've also uh, trademarked the swoosh with the word Nike. How this plays in, um, if we talk about Amazon, Brand Registry 2.0 needs to have a registered trademark. And until a couple months ago, they only accepted word marks. So if you had a logo, that could not serve as the prerequisite for brand registry. Now they accept word marks plus logos. And the reason why that's important is because what sets one trademark apart from another one is distinctiveness. So your trademark has to be distinctive. The higher the distinction, the easier time you're going to have with the USPTO examiner in getting your trademark registered. So as opposed to just a word, if you add some design or some objects, some colors, it'll differentiate it from an, another word, and you'll have an easier time getting it. Okay. There are two times when we hear sellers talk about intellectual property infringement. Um, we have people who are building their own brands and want to keep other people from stealing their intellectual property. And then you have people selling other people's brands that receive these notices through their Amazon accounts that they are infringing. How do you, how, how can you address like both of those different times and, and how maybe you could give people some guidance on how to deal with those? Sure. Let's use the real property example because it's tangible. When you own real property, you own a certain set of rights. Let's say that we own a land parcel and a house on there. What you own by having that real property is you can exclude other people like uh, burglars, in-laws. You can say, let. No, I can not in laws. My in -laws? Absolutely. You can exclude your in laws from going on there. So, people, infringers, will want to go on your property. And in the trademark sense, they'll want to use somebody's trademark to sell upon their goodwill. And then the opposite is true. If you're the rights owner, if you own the house and the property, you don't want those people to come on. So, you can exclude them. So now when we talk about that in the intellectual property sense, if you're a trademark holder, if you're the rights owner, as they say, then you can exclude others from using your intellectual property. And as I explained, all the intellectual properties are governed by different types of laws. So what's infringement for, let's say, patents is different for what's infringement for trademarks. Okay. Trademarks is a likelihood of confusion. So. A lot of people want to go and sell shoes online and they want to call them Mikey's or Nike's to have some type of confusion with Nike and pass off on their goodwill. On the flip side, once you start building your brand, you become successful. Once you get on page number one and you're the top seller in that particular area, other people are want to do the same things to you. And so when you want to avoid those pitfalls as you grow up and mature as a company, those are the same tools you're going to use against people that are 
trying to infringe yours. So you can actually get, you can have issues, not just, let's take the Nike example. If I started shoes and I put the word Nike on them, obviously that would be infringement. That would be counterfeiting. Counterfeiting, okay. <laughs> but what if I use Nike, uh, Mikey was the example you used. So similar sounding things that, that have confusion. So when you're naming your own brand, you want to be careful not to come too close. Absolutely. You see that all the time on Amazon. You see these private labelers that have things that are very similar for the yeah. brand name. Absolutely. Uh, one, one example is when you start selling jewelry, everybody knows the mysterious little blue box. Right. Everybody wants Tiffany's. So we've had a lot of clients get cease and desist letters or been sued because they use too close of a blue color. Or they sell um, scarves and they want to use the Burberry check pattern. Okay? okay, so all of those things aren't good. The reason why IP is so specialized is because they have their own laws, number one. They have their own updates and you have to keep abreast of all of these changes to be effective and to realize what it is. So a lot of people think that I'm not using somebody's trademark like Nike. I'm not using N-I-K-E, so I don't infringe. But there are several factors between eight and 11 factors, depending on what regional okay. circuit you're in, um, to evaluate whether Mikey for shoes would infringe. In my opinion, not looking at anything else, it would infringe. Right. Now, what about if you're, if you're a reseller and you're either selling wholesale products or arbitrage products and you get an IP, somebody files a claim against you. Um, what kind of issues, like when does it make sense to show that to an attorney or um, when does it make sense to ignore it, if ever? Like, how does that work? Number one, no matter what type of seller you are, if you ever want to sell on Amazon again, I would address it. Okay. That's hands down because um, too many sellers grow. Hey, I started out, I was only going to do it to make a couple of hundred bucks a month to get some drinking money with the boys. But hey, I started making some money and making significant profits. So if they didn't address that one rights owner complaint they got three years ago, it's going to be very difficult to resolve it now and Amazon may hold it against you later. So if you get subsequent ones. They remember. They do, they take copious <laughs> notes. They take copious notes. So whenever, even if it's an erroneous or uh, an illegal IP infringement notice that you receive, you should still file it and handle it with Amazon and not just ignore it. Oh yeah. Even if you're like, well, that's a product I don't even carry anymore still address it. Absolutely. Too many times people say, I only bought five of those items from Target for retail arbitrage. I'm never going to sell it again. That is the wrong answer if you ever want to continue with selling on Amazon. Okay. Um, let's say you do want to file a trademark. How long does that take between you know your application and you actually get your certificate that you can show Amazon? If we're talking about the United States before the United States Patent and Trademark Office, plan on if you've got a good trademark nine to 12 months okay and can you file like a trademark pending with amazon's brand registry or you have to actually have the final document you have to have a registered trademark for brand registry 2.0 um, interestingly enough not only can you use u.s trademarks but you can register in other countries oh, okay. um, many of those countries have much shorter trademark prosecution times than the u.s Oh, so one way you can shorten the process for your brand is to register in another country? That is correct. Okay. There are some and countries... I assume you can help people with that. Absolutely. Okay. You can get... I've seen it as fast as six weeks. Oh, wow. That's very fast. And then and Amazon takes that. Absolutely. C currently, they currently. do. Currently, <laughs> yes. Like Disclaimer. Everything with Amazon, we yeah. have a caveat, right? Now, let's say that you want to sell a product that's a licensed product. Um, Nike, Minions, whatever your thing is, that's actually, you know, this is a, this is a license thing. How, what kind of documentation do you need from your supplier, whether it's an international supplier or domestic supplier, to prove that you have the right to buy that from them and resell it? The number one thing is common sense. And from my experience, Amazon asks you, did you use common sense? Uh, I had a client that bought brand new 
state of the art this year iPads for less than $100 and was selling them for six, $700. And I asked that person, did it ever occur to you that these might not be real? He's like, no, my manufacturer said they're officially licensed. And he showed me a one page document. Well, price is usually one of the most significant factors. Number two is where did you get them from? Did you go to Shenzhen and there was this mud hut and they just had a stack of iPads laying around? Or did you go to some state-of-the-art facility? Or think about the brand too. Apple, um, Samsung, and a lot of the big, big, especially electronic companies, they don't allow unauthorized distributors to sell. Right. So, so to when, your point, we also, I, I know somebody who, they were at a trade show and there was somebody walking through the aisle selling inventory, you know, so oh, buy our product. And they thought, oh, well, this person must have a booth, but they're just going out and aggressively getting wires. So I bought a watch them. like that in New York City and one time. And it turns out they didn't even have a booth. Like they were just, it was totally counterfeit. So, yeah. So common sense. And then is there some kind of document you can get or how does that Work. Yes. Is it a one page, like few paragraphs and then that's legit, right? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, having dealt with licensing and especially intellectual property license with big companies, documents aren't one page. They're not 10 pages. Uh, they're not misspelled Chinese words on them. They use, if they're U.S. companies, they have U.S. big name law firms on both sides, both the licensee hired them and the licensor. Um, if it's a big, big name, they're not going to sell 10 units to you and risk that license because probably they're not allowed to sublicense if the license is real. Okay. Other times I've seen where the Chinese manufacturer does have a real license with the company, but it's for to sell in Indonesia, not here in the United States. And those are some of the things that they need to look for. So if you're considering license products, it's a really good idea to have that licensing agreement reviewed by an attorney. An attorney. Okay. <laughs> um, and it can seem sometimes when you're building a business, like these expenses can really add up, but you always have to look at the cost of not doing things the right way. And even if you have to grow your business slower, I think it's worth waiting and doing things the right way. Absolutely. And as you intimated earlier, um, if you start selling Nike and it's counterfeit, you can go to jail under 18 USC. Wow. There's significant six and seven figure penalties that the US Department of Justice can go after you and put you in jail. And even if you don't know it's counterfeit, right? You have to know, but it's the common sense thing. If you're buying the $75 brand new iPad, it's no, or you probably should have known. Okay. Um, and what about other platforms such as eBay, Jet, and Walmart? Do the kind of trademark and IP issues that we have on Amazon, do those carry across those other platforms? From my perspective, Amazon does a much better job at policing brands and counterfeit goods um, than, say, eBay, uh, where they're selling one particular product, simply because on Amazon, most sellers sell a thousand of an item or 10,000 right. it's so big but you can open up an eBay account under one email address sell two things and then stop it as you know Amazon you can't open a seller account get ungated for something sell a counterfeit and then open a new account tomorrow right theoretically <laughs> <laughs> Right. Is there any more little tidbits or like common stumbling blocks that you see people could have prevented Absolutely. Like you said, I think that an ounce of prevention really goes the mile. So even if you do some diligence or if you just converse with some attorney or keep abreast of issues, I think that'll help in the planning because it's never too early to plan. Okay, great. Jeff, thank you so much for being our guest today. Jeff also does work with eGrowth Partners, one of our sponsors, and we do have a members-only discount for their services. So if you guys want to check them out, they're on our website. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Cordelia. Hi, and welcome to the Scanner Society. We are a chamber of commerce for online selling entrepreneurs. Our members sell on Amazon, Jet, eBay, and beyond. We are brand builders and marketplace merchants, side hustlers and full-timers who simply want to help each other. 
join and connect at live events and online. We leverage the power of a large group to bring deals and resources to our members. You can save money with our discounts and learn in our interviews. You will also enjoy our safe zone, which is free of affiliate marketing and the guru mentality. We offer a 60 day money back guarantee. So join today and become a part of community connected commerce.